Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to Critically Reflecting on Your Degree Your Way that was implemented at the Arden University during the COVID-19 pandemic using Swan's Swampy Lowlands. Joining me is Lucy Castillo and, and sorry, Lucy Anna Sletto and Alice Castillo. And I'll be passing over the, to them for the presentation. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, so as as it's just been said, we we are critically reflecting on your degree your way, which is something that was implemented implemented at Arden University during the COVID nineteen pandemic, using Shern's Swampy Lowland. And I am Luciana Cletto. I'm a senior lecturer of psychology at Arden University, and my colleague. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Alice Castillo um, and I am Assistant Project Manager in Digital Learning Solutions at Arden University. I work in the uh, Innovation for Learning and Teaching Centre. Okay, so what are we going to cover then in this presentation? Um, and obviously this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind um, uh, tour through, through the the presentation, but we are going to talk about um, the reflective practice of Shun's Swampy Lowland and give a brief overview of your degree, your way um, that we've been um, implementing at Arden. And then we'll look at and reflect on the model using the Swampy Lowlands and ask ourselves, how uh, do we humanize digital learning? And we should also have a little bit of time, hopefully, at the end for any questions that you might have. And we'll give you our contact details as well, just in case anybody wants to contact us and chat about it anymore. So why did we choose Shern Swampy Lowlands? Um, basically, in, in higher education, we work and learn in the Swampy Lowlands um, by trial and error and from learning from mistakes. And everybody needs a map or a method to sort through and learn from all the muddles, the uncertainties and unclarities and mistakes that, that happen along the way. So the Swampy Lowlands was a, a useful image for our reflection on the Your Degree Your Way, um, as during the pandemic, we couldn't climb out of those lowlands and had to do our best down there. And it required us to enter that place of not knowing um, and so it fitted very well with with what we wanted to reflect on and, and we chose this method because of the reflection in action and the reflection on action and the reflection in action is this hovering hawk or this image of this hovering hawk that is in the mind that is about remembering skills experience and knowing at the right moment and then allowing us to draw on theories and knowledge as we go along Whereas the reflection on action is the reflection after the event and it's there to increase the effectiveness of that reflection in action. So with this in mind, um, I'll begin by giving you a short introduction to Your Degree Your Way, uh, which is a teaching model which originated at Arden with the premise of attempting to provide a uh, have your cake and eat it approach to our provision. And we wanted to give the students the chance to continue their learning, not pressing pause, but attend and engage by whatever way they felt best during this period. At Arden, we have programmes that are distance learning and blended learning. And so this particular approach was for the synchronous sessions for our blended learning students. So how did we start? Well, um, we put together a working group which was formed in June of 2020 to look at how to take teaching forward during lockdown for our blended learning students who are required to attend face-to-face -face classes as part of their learning, which is coupled with asynchronous content and activities. Uh, the initial rollout of Your Degree Your Way took place in September of 2020. So we had between June and September to get things into place. And whilst that was happening, students attended online sessions only. Um, so as a working group, we had to think about the safety of the staff and the students, as well as the setup for the rooms. So um, as well as protective equipment and social distancing parameters, all of our study centre rooms were fitted with equipment for online sessions, um, such as cameras, which were controlled with remote controls by the lecturers, and sure microphones to enhance the sound quality. Uh, students could 
use a booking system to book onto the sessions which each week uh, for each week so then they would come into the centres and they could choose to either join the class online or in the centre and this meant that our teaching staff would be teaching to a class of students who um, could be in the room or they could be joining in the zoom room and this mo model was chosen with the aim of accommodating all of our students to give them optionality in access and to avoid pausing their learning and thinking now about reflection in action and what lessons were learned so more time for intensive training would have been a real benefit and as with the rest of the sector um, this is something that obviously it wasn't possible but our lecturers were they were very used to teaching face to face and they were thrown into using zoom to teach via this new hybrid model when some had never taught online before so that intensive training that took place um, we would have really benefited from having more time with them um, it's not just the teaching that had shifted so working practices of a university had to change too the working group consisted of people from um, academic and professional service roles across centres and the head office meeting online and we needed to use meeting software to test the model remotely so we did this by having some centre staff present to others that were working at home or in our offices. We needed to check connections to make sure the equipment would work as intended and would be accessible for all of our students, joining on varying devices. And uh, in addition to this, we needed to test these things, not just in our UK centres, but also deploy and equip our centre in Berlin as well. Uh, there was also a need to acknowledge the differences between teaching a live session online and a live session face to face to deliver a good learning experience for our students. And I think not only at Arden, but across the sector, having gone through this experience, there is a better understanding now of online distance blended and face to face learning. And particularly with those hybrid models, um, there is a need to have engaging and interacting activities which are asynchronous and that complement and support face-to-face -face sessions. Okay, so after after the event, then we, we reflected on and used the reflection on action to see what improvements needed to be made. And these, this is just a summary of some of the main things that we found, which first of all was that the digital capabilities of not only the staff, but also the students needed to be improved to use the tools that we were using really well. Um, and obviously hindsight is a wonderful thing, but we want um, to use this experience as a learning opportunity. And that has included collecting regular feedback from both our staff and students. Um, but one of the main themes that came up um, for us was about humanising online teaching. And by humanising online teaching, we can be more inclusive. We can use digital pedagogy as a tool to support with delivery rather than it just being the form of delivery. So digital technologies instruct teachers how to teach and how to interact in digital spaces. And we've adopted these without sort of looking critically at them um, and their impact on the teaching and learning. So what's come to light from this pandemic and in, across the board in the sector really is not that we need better digital tools, although of course in some cases we could do with that as well, but more that educators have no idea how to reach out across the screen to students um, that we can't see. So how do we uh, start thinking about humanising digital learning? Well, we need to stop thinking of learning as happening solely online. And because learning does not happen online without that human interaction, um, and it happens in real places with other humans, we need to add space into our relationships with students because the immediacy of the classroom is no longer an affordance. And technology alone does not know how to teach or how to build relationships. It's vital to build that connection with our students. And we as educators need to trust ourselves. We need to invest in digital capabilities and we need to grow in to create learning experiences that ensure our students are more than just faces on screens that we can mute and we can give grades to. 
And we also need to start thinking about acting inclusively to help with promoting humanising learning. Um, all teams and departments can use inclusive practices, which help to make things more personal, more accessible and more human. And it's been really great to see access and inclusion in so many of the presentations at the ORC conference, highlighting the way forward for us as a sector, really. And we would like to invite you now, as we continue this discussion, um, by input into our Padlet board, which the link will be shared in the chat with you. Um, and if you've not used Padlet before, you just need to click on the plus sign at the bottom of the screen on the right hand side, and you can add in your thoughts there. And we are asking, what does humanising online teaching mean to you and why is it important? Um, and hopefully there'll be some time at the end of the session for us to have a look at, at some of your thoughts. Um, and while that's happening, uh, we're going to talk through some of our thoughts on this area as well. Yes, so the next section really is about practices to humanise education or humanise online education. So we're going to focus on the pedagogical practices that promote care for the whole student and class experience rather than just the technical aspects of online teaching. So these are some of the areas that we're going to cover um, over the next few slides. And the first one then is build and maintain community, which is one of the, the, the really crucial areas um, when, when humanizing online um, education. And we're just gonna focus on online class commitments, uh, building connectedness and then temperature checks as well because it can take time to establish norms and practices of being present and mindful and safe when you're online um, and so you might bring a set of values to your students so that they can expand on and provide feedback so that you co-create um, what is expected in your online space with your students um, and some examples that you know you might put in there are things like about being present, um, listening deeply, using one mic and trying not to interrupt each other. And if you do, to apologise, you know, and making space and also taking that space um, so, so that it is there for everybody. Um, being open to learning and being comfortable with being uncomfortable, as it often can be when we're learning new things. And even more so to some people in an online space. Um, other things are things like using personal pronouns and gender conscious language. Um, and you can support that by using the rename function um, online so that students can add that as well. And, and so can you. Um, being punctual and um, that, you know, saying that we expect full and safe participation in online sessions. Um, so, you know, trying to avoid distractions like driving while they're in a lesson, multitasking, and I know it's unavoidable at times, but but just sort of trying to make that expectation as well. Um, and, you know, and also just asking students how we need to engage to foster a respectful and creative um, community and, in, and asking them to, to participate in that. So, authenticity does tend to transfer across the digital platform um, so it's it's wonderful practice to sort of makes go space for co-learning and being transparent with students um, when you're working out technology glitches for instance to support their learning as well and it can be really helpful to engage students in a temperature check at, say at the beginning of a lesson um, because it's just much harder to tell how students are doing um, when you're in a virtual space and this can help get a read on the virtual room that you're in and can just help students to feel more comfortable and warm up to speaking online as well. There's lots of different ways you can do that um, and also quite quickly so whether it's like a high and a low point for them or rep representing their week with an emoji or a hashtag or sharing how they're doing in the form of a weather pattern or forecast are just some ideas that, that you can bring in as well. Also things like inviting announcements, celebrations, um, because these are the sort of things that students would do in, um, in person when they walk into a classroom. So it's just making an, an intentional space for that to happen. Um, so 
also just taking time for students to share appreciation of one another again um, whether it's related to class or not so that it can help to foster community when you're not in person and also you can ask students to to use video to help maintain human connectedness i know that's not also always possible but again encouraging students to have that connectedness with each other outside of of, of the lessons as well okay. so one of the other areas is about being prepared and uh, one one point we were thinking about is about sharing your agenda and I know we've added in our contents at the beginning of this slide but it can be useful for students to have that separately so that they can actually look at it while you're going through the session um, and sort of know what's coming and, and have that in advance. The other points about being prepared are all sort of linked to group work and also making sure that we have group rules. So things like the breakout rooms, you know, so planning that in advance or, and deciding, you know, if you're going to add in polls and things, you can always set that up before. But then also giving really clear instructions um, about how those groups are going to run um, in the breakout rooms, um, giving people assigning roles to them. So whether they're, they're the timekeeper or the facilitator, what they're going to do when they come back into the main room and being really clear about that, starting classes with a tech tutorial, you know, not assuming that everybody knows what they what they can, what they have to do. Um, and, you know, giving instructional activities. So when the students come into the session, they can already be working on those um, before you get started on the session. So sort of looking on from that, really, it's uh, really important to um, be prepared for your sessions. And part of knowing what uh, to do with your tools is part of that. And at Arden, we use Zoom to teach our online sessions. So using that as an example, uh, we encourage our educators to use the functionality within that. And so it's really important for our students to have the time to learn how to use the tool just as much as the educator. And so taking the time to explain how to use Zoom at the start of a module means that they can fully utilize and access it properly, making the most of the breakout rooms, uh, the different views, um, and things like the keyboard sh shortcuts as well. And the chat function is a really good way to help with humanizing learning. We can encourage our students um, to use the chat function during class. You might want to set some community norms for your course as well. Um, but you could you can do things like sending comments, sending thumbs up, using the emojis as as whilst others are speaking, because when you are face to face, you have things like gestures and um, remarks that students might make. Uh, and that's when you know that they, they might be engaged. But by using the chat function, you can um, invite this interaction into those sessions as well. And students might share encouragement or appreciation for each other's ideas too. And something else that we have reflected on uh, to improve in this area um, in terms of our practice uh, is to think about selecting certain tools to use throughout a module or a program. So it might be Padlet or Jamboard, Wakelet or Mentimeter. It's, it's a really good idea to choose one or two tools and stick with them for the duration of a module, as well as helping to overcome institutional license queries. Um, this does give both educators and students the opportunity to learn functionality and really enjoy the tool for learning and encourage more participation. And taking the time to know your tools can also encourage the use of them to support and foster equitable participation. And thinking about access of tools and the content and, and give yourself time to ask questions and think whether there's something that you can do around this area. So while you're setting things up, could I do this if I couldn't see? Could I uh, do this if I was using a keyboard instead of using a mouse? Could I do this if I um, am colorblind and can't distinguish between red and green? Could I do this if uh, the content triggered memories of something traumatic that might have happened in, in my past? And these questions could be related to several different things. So access needs, queries on inclusivity, digital poverty, decolonizing digital learning and sensitivity. So it's really important to think about these areas while we're planning for sessions. 
and using things like trigger warnings ahead um, of especially difficult topics and clear signposting to university support can help with students feeling more confident in wanting to engage too. Um, other areas that we can think about with this really, we can uh, use the raising of your hand function um, to track and making sure that you are tracking those. So it might be the, the tech hand, it might be the real hand, um, but you, you might want to have a protocol in place in acknowledging as these hands come up. So then the students know that their, their, their engagement is appreciated and wanted in the session. Um, if you have to do a roll call to check in on a topic, let students know in advance that you're going to be doing this so that they don't feel um, vulnerable and put on the spot. And uh, think about, as students are sharing out, pause to invite anyone to speak who hasn't yet spoken. And obviously, it's, that's a difficult thing to do while we're, we're all working online and, and trying to encourage that participation, but give them that opportunity. And, and it's you can be surprised as to how many students are going to take you up on that as they are asked to engage. And looking now at sort of sharing out, well, when we want to, um, when we want each person in the class to have an opportunity to speak to something, we could be asking for a volunteer who would like to begin. And when that person finishes, we could ask them to then tag in another student. So this keeps the flow going and ensures everyone's speaking. It builds up the community environment for students to uh, engage in, in that um collective work and uh, thinking as well about things that we would do in a face-to-face -face setting so a student might be having a difficult time and students or they might find that they've been triggered by something and students can't give their classmate a, a consensual hug or if they're sitting next to them they can't just grab a tissue if we're online it's it's not that easy so if you are teaching a class where challenging topics and experiences come up be prepared to hold that space and offer validation and, and affirmation and create space for that dialogue and provide guidance for those students that need it. Um, and sort of thinking now in terms of our, our model, our Your Degree Your Way model, we also suggested getting students to monitor chats. So having a role for your students within the space within breakout rooms so that being in the class or online wouldn't be a hindrance as they could still participate and interact with their peers. And finally, the, the last point that we wanted to look at is just about being flexible, being patient and most importantly, being yourself, um, because I think we all know that technical glitches happen and that some of the things that were supposed to happen in person just are not the same online. So, you know, we're all still, all students and faculties are, are still adapting to the new challenges of, of being online. And, um, and you know, this is, is something that's happening still now and everybody's holding a lot because of that. And it's just important to sort of remind ourselves and the students of this and that we really need to cultivate comp passion for one another and ourselves and having that authenticity when glitches happen can create bridges of connection as well and also just remembering to take breaks um, you know and taking around five minutes each hour as a minimum um, and encouraging people to to move and stretch as it can otherwise can just take a really long time that you're sitting at your computer without actually taking a break um, and also just, you know, logging in a few minutes before class so you can chat informally with students as you would normally if you were in the classroom and invite students to ask questions um, as others are logging off, but obviously keeping boundaries so that you're not spending hours and hours doing that. Um, and, and like I already mentioned, just encouraging students to use video conferencing with between themselves to connect to one another outside the classroom. That can also help as well for group work but socialising and, 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 you know, sort of sharing virtually as well. And, you know, you need to bring your energy as well because online learning spaces do need energy. Um, so that's really important as well. And just being, being yourself. And these are just a couple of our references. And thank you all for joining us. 
and um, we've got our contact details there and um, we can see that people have already been adding some comments to the Padlet, which is fantastic. There's lots of things on there. It was just distracting me a moment ago, just having a look at all the, all the great comments. Um, I'm not sure if we can share that now or if there's, there's a lot time. of comments coming through in the um, conversation, Lucy, and we've got a couple okay. of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one is from Caitlin. Caitlin's asked, how did you do, how did you go about defining each of your modalities? We're in the process of creating shared language at our university now. That's a great question. Um, so we, uh, when we were looking initially at the sort of your degree your way model we already had in place um, distance learning programs and blended learning programs uh, we had um, when we set up the working group the initial idea came from a conversation where um, our uh, CEO had said I want the students to have their cake and eat it and so for about three or four months of the process that was the reference to our working group and that was the reference to the model um, and it took a bit of time, really, to think about how we wanted to take that forward. But as we continue to work together as a group and I think having that shared understanding across the departments and bringing in um, people from all different teams, it helped us to distinguish between those models. And in, uh, it wasn't just sort of a something that was siphoned off um, as an academic project or something that was just sort of led by the academic registry it was we worked together and I think that was where we saw our similarities with what we wanted to bring for the students and we wanted to bring that equitable experience for our students as well um, I'm not sure whether that really answers the question but that was sort of how we how we came to that model uh, so my advice would be to have those conversations with across departments I'm not sure whether lucy's got anything more to add on that really no i think i think you've pretty much covered it and um yeah i think it helped that we had the the distance learning and the blended learning to start with um so so no i think that covered the, the question thanks um you've got another question come from kathy kathy's asked have you considered adopting the same tools across the university rather than just across one module Yes, yes, we have definitely. And, and that is something that we've, we've, we've sort of been working towards rather than just having different ones across all the, all the modules because um, obviously staff need training in those. Um, so, so we have been looking at some sort of um, basic tools that, that could benefit everybody really um, and then trying to stick with those because we found that otherwise what, what um, people do is they tend to go and sign up to to free um, tools themselves and then that brings a whole host of other issues so so yes definitely rather than just across modules it it's been looking at um, you know tools across the whole university I think that's the last question unless anyone else has any further questions they want to ask we've got a lot of applause going on or wash hands as people are saying at the moment <laughs> Uh, so yeah, um, we seems to be that everyone's really enjoyed the session and it'd be great to carry on the conversation in Discord if you could share your slides and resources over on there. Um, I've shared the Padlet for everyone already. So yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you, you and thank you to everybody for going getting into that Padlet as well. I'm really excited to have a good look at what's in there. Yeah, lots of answers. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.